Hello. Take a look at this little milk jug. I suppose in many ways it's quite unremarkable, like something you might find in a country-style kitchen, certainly not in a luxury manor house or a fancy penthouse apartment in Manhattan. It's something from an ordinary kitchen. The most remarkable thing about it is the fact that it was made by the godfather of studio ceramics, Bernard Leach. And of course that's the point. For Leach, the important thing about ceramic pieces like this was their ordinariness. There is a kind of morality in its everyday quality. It's not meant for a prince or a city banker to show off their wealth or refined taste. It's meant to be used by anyone. Of course, now having a Bernard Leach pot does show a kind of refined taste and even wealth. But in his guiding philosophy, Leach wanted to revive a kind of vernacular or folk pottery tradition that he believed had once existed in England before industrialization, in which pottery was functional and to be used by the people who made it. Now that belief seems to be embodied in the look of this jug itself. We're left in little doubt that it's a handmade object, made on the potter's wheel. It shows the marks of its making. And although it's glazed, there is no attempt to use the glaze to hide the making process, the places where the potter's hand once held the raw clay. In fact, Leach's earth pigment glazes seem to emphasise and even add to the imperfections of the piece so that we can never imagine that this was produced by a machine. In that, it stands in stark contrast to what we might think of as typical of, say, Bauhaus ceramics. Here's a tea service designed by the founder of the Bauhaus, Walter Gropius. There is very little to even suggest that these objects are made of clay, and the smooth surface and high gloss white glaze not only suggests a machine production method, but also dehumanises the pottery, taking away any sense of the hand of the maker. If Leach's pottery revels in its own materiality, the clayness of the clay as it were, the Gropius pieces seem to want to deny their own material nature the clay becomes incidental. Effectively, Leach fits into a broader artistic movement that came to the fore after the First World War in both sculpture and ceramics, led by figures such as Barbara Hepworth, Henry Moore and Jacob Epstein. For these artists, if your sculpture was made of stone, you shouldn't try to hide the stone with over-refined carving or covering it in paint. Instead, you should celebrate its own stoniness. So that when you look at a Hepworth or Moore from this period, you are never in any doubt as to what the sculpture is made of. And the same is true of a Bernard Leach pot. Unlike his contemporary Walter Gropius, there is no attempt to hide the clay. And unlike some Victorian pottery, there is no attempt to make the clay look like other objects, like real flowers or animals or fruit. The clay always looks like clay, and it always looks like handmade clay. The material nature of the pot is paramount. So how do we fit a ceramicist like Lucy Ree into this schema? Is she more like Bernard Leach or Walter Gropius? Looking at a bowl like this by Lucy Ree, our immediate answer might be that she's more like Gropius. Although we don't see a high gloss white finish, the forms are regular, almost geometric in places, unlike anything we might expect to find in a leech. The relative thinness of the clay suggests a refinement, so that it has been suggested that these are very much urban pots, perhaps even urban and urbane. And we can contrast that again with the rustic forms of leech. Certainly there are key differences between leech and Ree, so that we can point to leech basing himself in the rural setting of St Ives in Cornwall, while Ree was based in the heart of West London. Ree also came out of a very different arts and crafts tradition to Leach, in many ways one that was much closer to that of Gropius. She was born into a sophisticated Viennese family, her father was a doctor, and she was trained in a middle European ceramic tradition that was far less wedded to the rough finish that we see in a Leach. Her mentors were people like the architect Joseph Hoffman. But look again at this little bowl. The glaze is not incidental to our appreciation of it, and it moves Lucy Ree in a definite direction away from the aesthetic of Gropius. The machine production method demands standardisation and uniformity, but in Ree's work we often see the glazes run in unexpected directions, so that we can say with some certainty that she left this aspect of her work to chance. 
It's almost as though she embraced the surrealist concept of the happy accident in which she might have had some idea as to what the glaze would be like, but the material nature of the glaze in combination with the material nature of the clay pot always threw up unexpected surprises. In fact, we know that Lucy Ree embraced this element of the unexpected in her working method. While most potters fire their pots twice, first firing the clay pot without a glaze in what is called biscuit firing, and then firing again in a glaze firing, Ree did not do this. She fired her pots only once, cutting out the biscuit firing. The consequence of this was that oxides and other impurities in the clay tended to bleed into the glaze, so that if you look at a re pot, you'll often see a speckled or mottled effect. This is a direct consequence of this way of working, and you cannot predict what the mottling will look like. So it's an unexpected element that is controlled, in effect, by the clay itself. So Lucy Ree may produce work that we might want to characterise as urban and urbane when set against the rustic quality of Bernard Leach but that doesn't make her like Walter Gropius. Like Leach, she does not attempt to completely denature her pottery. In both, there is an embrace of the materiality of clay, that clayness of clay, and a desire to allow that clay to express its own nature, and in effect, dictate at least part of its own artistic form. <laughs>